Welcome to First Evangelical Free Church in Maplewood, Minnesota. If you have questions or comments after hearing this week's message online, feel free to write us on our blog or on our Facebook page. We'd be happy to respond and connect with you. And now let's hear from God's Word. Good morning. I want to uh, recognize uh, formally that uh, the month of January, I think the official day was last Sunday, but oftentimes we'll move it around based on different events, but uh, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, Sanctity of Human Life Month, uh, we value life both in the womb and at the end of life because God is the one who gives life, amen? Amen. And so uh, be mindful of that. Uh, There's a flyer in your first free today in reference to uh, the new life ministries that we support and that you can support and be praying for and be involved in their ministries. So uh, unashamedly so, uh, we should never budge on the issue of life uh, from the beginning to the end. It's a gift from God. Uh, One other quick shout out. uh, If any of you are interested in Uh, leadership, uh, young people, uh, older people aspiring to leadership. Uh, We're all leaders in one capacity or another, and uh, Kevin Jacobson and myself have started a class uh, starting in January. One session's already taken place. Don't worry about missing it. I missed the first session. (laughs) I was gone uh, to Phoenix, but uh, the next class is this Tuesday night, and you come as couples, uh, come as a single person, single again, men and women alike, Uh, We're also developing, uh, going to be developing, you'll hear more about it in this coming year, a deacon structure here at First Free, and there are biblical qualifications for being deacons, uh, husband and wife serving as a deacon couple, uh, or single people as well, and uh, this would be great training ground for leadership. Even if you are thinking about leadership principles, the principles that come from God's word can be applied in life as a whole, Uh, but in particular, uh, this course is called Biblical leadership, and we'd invite you to take advantage of it. So, you ready? Should we preach the word this morning? Should we do that? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the incredible gift of your word, and we thank you for the amazing gift of prayer. Those two disciplines are foundational to our sanctification and our walk and our relationship with you. Thank you that you have communicated to us through the holy, inspired, inerrant scriptures, the word of God. And thank you, Lord, that we're not automatons or robots that just look at ink on pieces of paper, albeit inspired, but that through your word that we can know what it means to be in relationship with you and that we can communicate with you. You are the God who is there. And not the God of deism, creating and then off at a distance, not interacting with what you created. You are the God of the Bible who has communicated in time, space, history, throughout the Old Testament, through your Son, Jesus, by your Spirit, through the church, and through your Word, even to this day. And so, Lord, refresh our souls regarding the significance of prayer this morning and these next few weeks as we think about it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the subject of prayer is a very significant subject, not just a subject to be studied biblically, but a practice to engage in as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. You can just take the beginning of the Bible and do your own journey all the way through to the end. It would take a long time to just touch on all of the prayers, even briefly. But you think of Abraham, the father of the faith, and all of his interactions with God as God was revealing himself to him, and Abraham talking back to God. You think of Moses a burning bush going on a mountain, taking his shoes off in the holy presence of God himself. You think of David and what's recorded for us in the Psalms over and over and over again, his prayers given to us and to the body of Christ as a gift 
prayers of confession, prayers of praise. And you just follow his life even in the historical books and you see that David is a man of prayer. You think of Old Testament kings. Not too many of them were so great, but I love the famous prayer of Jehoshaphat in the Old Testament who was facing physical enemies and impacted earlier on in life in ministry, me personally, and I still remember on a regular basis when I I don't know what to do, when we don't know what to do as a church body, as we think about the future at times. Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are set upon you. The prayer of King Jehoshaphat from the Old Testament. We think of the prophets crying out and praying to God Almighty. You think of Daniel in Daniel chapter 6 verses 10 and 11 under incredible pressure in life secular pressure on him and his friends to compromise. And Daniel, what does he do on a regular basis? Man of prayer, three times a day, getting up in the morning, in the evening, praying, praying, praying. It's a compelling example. We think of Mary in the New Testament and God revealing to her that she's pregnant and she's had no relations and an angel coming and meeting her and we see Mary in simplicity and in faith praying, Lord, let it be unto me as you've said. We see the example over and over again in the New Testament with Paul and the early church. We think of Jesus. Stop just for a moment and think very, very Seriously about this. We think of Jesus, God himself in human flesh, the God-man. Jesus, 100% God, 100% man. Don't need to pray. Right? He does an (laughs) all-nighter. He does an all-nighter in prayer before he chooses the disciples. We see him in Gethsemane crying out to God. The example of Jesus in and of itself so incredibly compelling. We think of elders and leaders in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, and throughout the epistles. They are to be about the ministry of the word and prayer. The significance of prayer in the Bible cannot be underestimated. And so uh, take your Bibles, and here we are in Matthew uh, chapter 6, and we pick up in verses uh, 5 through 8, and we'll walk in exposition through these 5, 6, 7, 8, through these four verses. Uh, As we do, I want to give us a reminder of where we're at. We had Mark back with us last week, a little bit of a break from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, We're still in the first discourse of Jesus recorded by Matthew. It's the first speech, the extended speech. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And it's all about seeking after God's righteousness. We've got to keep that in mind. What kind of righteousness is God looking for? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, we have the control verse for all of the Sermon on the Mount. And what is true righteousness and what is false righteousness? righteousness. And then in chapter 6, verse 1, a couple of weeks ago, if you were here, I introduced this section that we have before us in chapter 6, 1 to 18, by saying that the control verse is verse 1 of chapter 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. And we talked a couple weeks ago, uh, pretty directly, pretty boldly, pretty bluntly, about motivation how very significant motivation is when it comes to practicing our righteousness, when it comes to living out spiritual disciplines, if you will, primarily the word of God in prayer, but some others that Jesus gives, almsgiving, that's where we were a couple weeks ago, when we're giving to the poor. Uh, This morning and for the next couple of weeks, prayer, when we're practicing prayer, how are we to do it? And then in a few weeks, we'll look at the subject of fasting. How incredibly providential now that if you were here last week when I made some significant comments about where we are as a church in transition and moving into the future, how incredibly providential that this first Sunday back in the pulpit after last week with Mark Beck here and so on that we pick up on the subject of prayer. One famous writer says this section is both humbling 
and searching section of Scripture on how not to pray and how to pray. Of how not to pray and how to pray. We're to not be parading our, our, our piety around. One writer calls this section, these verses before us this morning, publicity and verbosity versus privacy and simplicity. I like that. Publicity and verbosity. Here's the message in a nutshell. Versus privacy and simplicity. On the one hand, listen carefully, prayerlessness is sin. To not be people of prayer is sin. So on the one hand, prayerlessness is sin, but on the other hand, prayer with the wrong motivation is also sin. Both our prayerlessness and at times our wrong motivation humble us this morning. Just a quick side comment. Every time I preach on the subjects of prayer, Bible reading, and giving, as much as I'm personally committed to all three of them, it's a humbling thing. I don't pray as I ought. I don't pray as I ought. And yet, I'll touch on this a little bit later, as I continue to mature and grow in the Lord, as one in vocational ministry called to serve as a preaching and teaching pastor, I find an increasing, deepening dependence on the Lord in prayer in order to keep my head in the ball game and keep pressing ahead in the Lord. I'll come back to that just a little bit later as we open up our passage this morning. So, two real simple points. The first is this, the motivation and location for prayer. Put your finger in the text, take a look at your Bibles, uh, and uh, follow along with me. Notice the motivation and the location for prayer. And when you pray, uh, remember the control verses, chapter 6, verse 1, and when you give to the poor, almsgiving, not tithing, but giving to the poor, it was expected of Jesus' disciples. It's expected of us to give to those who are needy, starting in the body of Christ and reaching out to the world. And when you fast in a couple of weeks, it's something that we ought to be doing. And when you pray, not if you pray, not if you ever consider praying, not every now and then you, you might want to pray, but when you pray, disciples of Jesus, are you a follower of Christ? If so, this ought to be our regular practice. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Who are the hypocrites? He mentions it regarding almsgiving. He mentions it regarding fasting. He mentions it right here. He doesn't have to even say what their names are. They are disciples and follower of Je followers of Jesus. And he knows... From the earlier context, they know from the earlier context that when Jesus talks about the hypocrites, he's talking about the religious hierarchy. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Yep, who? The Pharisees. For they love to stand and pray. It's an interesting study. I have a study sheet I prepared many years ago just on the postures of prayer and worship in the Bible. Kneeling, totally on your face, examples of that. Sitting, standing, and during the New Testament times, it was very common for people to stand, not sit, fold their hands, and bow their heads. That's good, keeps us from being distracted. I'll be honest with you, sometimes I pray with my eyes open. And uh, even in public settings, I'll sometimes pray with my eyes open. I'm thinking, I'm processing, I'm praying, I'm engaged in prayer. Uh, sometimes good to close our eyes in case we are distracted and so on. But one of the postures was to stand and to stand with your hands outstretched towards heaven like this. And apparently that might have been one of the situations that was taking place here. These hypocrites, the scribes and the Pharisees, they love to stand and pray in the synagogues, uh, the houses of worship. And at the street corners, the Greek word here is not the side street. It's not a little side cul-de-sac or whatever, but it's the word that's used. And there's two different words. It's the words that use, that's used for the main thoroughfare. <laughs> they're on the main road. And they're there intentionally and on purpose. Sometimes you're on the main road. Sometimes you're on the side road. And there were two different historical, cultural, social kinds of things that would take place. 
Uh, there was, in first century Judaism, during the time of Jesus, a couple of different ways in which people prayed. People would pray on a daily basis, in the morning and in the evening, the Shema, from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, can go on to verse 5, all the way to verse 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might. And in the morning and in the evening, they would pray that. So there were morning prayers and there were evening prayers, and they would recite that prayer. There was something else called the Shimone. There were 18 different petitions in the Shimone. Sounds like the Shema, but it's something different. It was called the Shimone, 18 different petitions or prayers, and they were prayed three times a day, often at 9 o'clock in the morning, at noon, and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So Shema in the morning and in the evening, probably at home, can't see you then, but the Shimone, 18 petitions at 9 in the morning, at noon, and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And if you're walking on the street and it's noon, you just stop and you pray. I see that even in some cultures today. I won't go into the examples, but maybe you've seen some on TV. So they're standing in the corner and they have this posture of standing and praying and Jesus speaking to his disciples say says this, these people are hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners. Why? Here's the motivation that they may be seen by others. We talked about this and hit it real hard a couple weeks ago. It's not just what we do as we walk with the Lord, but it is our motivation for what we do. And the human heart is wicked and deceitful, and at times our motivation can be totally whacked. And we don't even often see it or know it. But if we stop and we analyze and we ask the Spirit of God to bring us the conviction, we can see at times that our motivation is a self-centered motivation, even in prayer. Even in Bible reading, and so in particular here, Jesus goes beyond external righteousness and he goes for the heart and the motivation. They love to do this so that they may be seen by others. Truly, truly I say to you that they uh, will receive their reward. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago if you weren't here, but what kind of reward do you want? Do you want the praise of men? And if you get that kind of reward, you've gotten your reward, Jesus says, that's it. Or do you want the praise of God? Because your motivation matched your action and your desire was simply for his fame and not our acclaim. You remember that from a couple weeks ago? God's fame and not our acclaim. So where and why we pray is critical. Verse 5, verse 6, prayer is first and foremost intimacy with the Almighty. But when you pray, not if, but when. When you pray, hear it today brothers and sisters in Christ. Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. If you're in your room, it's in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you in your relationship with Him. You know, over the years I've heard the phrase, you know, going into the prayer closet. It may come from this text. I'm not sure. I didn't do any research to find out. Uh, you know, the inner room, a small room, a small closet. I've often wondered over the years, I've never prayed in my closet. My shoes are in there, so it's just not a good idea. So <laughs> take them out. No, I'm just kidding. My shoes don't smell. But anyway, I've never, uh, never prayed in the closet. But what's the whole point? Find the tiniest room in the house? The whole point is to get away. What is prayer? It's a conversation with God. And to get away from the noise and the busyness of the world that we're in, to put the phone away so that we can hear from God and not the distractions of this world, to pull back into intimacy with the Almighty. Now, whenever we're preaching through a passage or studying a passage of Scripture, and I've thought of this passage over the years, well, does this mean you know, never any public prayer? Uh, Jesus isn't saying here uh, or teaching here the full teaching on prayer and so on because in the Old Testament and New Testament alike, there was public prayer. It was commanded in the church, the reading of Scripture and prayer. There were public prayer meetings and prayer gatherings that took place. He's not forbidding public prayer. Examples abound Old Testament and New Testament alike. What he is saying is that prayer is first and foremost intimacy with the Almighty. 
The issue is intimacy of communion with God in one's heart. Who are we talking to in prayer? Almighty God. And because of what has been done for us through the cross and through Christ and the gospel, we have an instant invitation at any time, no matter what's happening at work, at school, at home, in our family, in the quietness of our own heart, at any time we can have confidence to come in childlike faith into the presence of Almighty God. Can there be any greater privilege on planet Earth? When you think of all the other world religions and ways in which they uh, seem to, t- or the, the, the ways in which they teach that you can seem to be in the presence of God. It's always human beings trying to do something to be acceptable and, and barriers between us and God. You don't need a priest. You don't need a shaman. You don't need a mystic. You don't need anybody else. You don't need another brother or sister in Christ. We need each other to pray for one another, but we have direct access to God Almighty because of what God has done for us in Christ. There is no greater privilege on the planet. And to think that God wants to communicate with you and me, not just communicate the text of Scripture, but to communicate in real relationship with him. I can't see God, though. None of us can. We can see him through the eyes of faith, through the person and work of Jesus People in the Old Testament didn't see God and they believed in him and followed after him by faith. In the New Testament, they saw him, the disciples, in human flesh and followed after him and came to realize that he was God in human flesh. And the church and the church around the world in Asia and Africa and Europe and China and South America, in Australia, New Zealand, all around the world today where there are true believers, they believe by faith and experience a personal relationship with God. And a big part of that is through prayer. I love Martin Lloyd-Jones, and I've been reading his substantive work on the Sermon on the Mount, so powerful, so convicting. He writes this, Man, men and women alike, man is never greater when he is there in communion and contact with God. Man is never greater than when he is there in prayer, in communion, and contact with God. It's a great privilege. Are you taking advantage of it? Have you lost your fervor in prayer? Is your relationship with the Lord primarily intellectual and it starts there in and through the word? It's the word that guides and directs us in prayer and that's so very significant. We'll get to that in a second point here this morning. Are you talking with God? As I said a few minutes ago, I find, um, I messed around with a couple of different words. I first used the word desperation. I don't know that it's desperation as much it is, as it is dependence, an increasing dependence in daily conversation with the Lord. You would think that any of us, as we grow and mature and so on, that we would become a little more suave and a little more slick and a little more efficient and a little more competent. Yes, competency comes with experience and life and application, and yet at the same time, I find in my soul an increasing dependence upon the Lord. Primarily, and I know I use this phrase a lot, to keep my head in the ball game, to keep pressing ahead, to keep walking with the Lord, not that I want to give up, but to keep encouraged and to have hope and trust and faith in God for wisdom and guidance and dependence. That is so very, very important. What do we bring to God? Uh, Today we're celebrating my wife's birthday. I just added this quick illustration this morning, and then I'll get to my second point, but my wife doesn't even know that this move in my soul. Some this morning, we're celebrating my wife's birthday today. It's on Wednesday, but I have to go to Chicago with a few of the other pastors to our annual pastor's theological conference, so we can't celebrate her birthday on Wednesday. We're celebrating it, Sharon and I, tomorrow night, so don't worry about that. But I said to her this morning, I don't have a gift <laughs> for today when we're formally celebrating. Now, I can still, you know, pull it off by tomorrow night, so, okay, so just... just. <laughs> Not a total slug, so just hang in there. So, okay. But I don't have a gift, and my wife said this. She said, it doesn't matter, honey. We're all together. We're all together. So, so God, I, I don't have a gift. I'm not such a great Christian, and I can hear God's voice say, it doesn't matter, we're together. 
Yeah, I don't have it all straightened out. I've been struggling with this area of sin. It doesn't matter. I paid the price. Confess and repent, but we're together. Yeah, but, you know, I've just been flat in my spiritual walk. It doesn't matter. We're together, just you and God. And he loves you with an everlasting love. He cares for you. He longs for you to come to him again and again and again, no matter what the need is. Big and small alike. Doesn't matter. So long as you're spending time quietly together with the Lord. The motivation and location for prayer. Verses 5 and 6. Look at the text. The simplicity and substance of prayer, verses 7 and 8. The simplicity and substance of prayer, verses 7 and 8. Notice in verse 7, we're encouraged to avoid unusual and unbiblical approaches to prayer. Let me say it again. The main point is the simplicity and substance of prayer. Now, if you're taking notes and you want to get the subpoint, verse 7 is all about avoiding unusual and unbiblical approaches to prayer. And when you pray, catch that? When you pray, not if. When you pray, it's expected of us. Do not heap up empty phrases. That's a cool Greek word. It's the word bata logeo, logeo, logos words, bata. Uh, It's just a a babbling word. (laughs) The NIV translates this to babble. The King James, vain repetitions. The ESV, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases. It's an onomatopoeic word. Remember that from school? An onomatopoeic word onomatopoeic word, (laughs) Uh, onomatopoeic. So uh, that's a kind of word that sounds like the thing that it is. Sizzle or buzz (laughs) or any list of other words. Here's this word that just means to babble, to babble, to babble, to babble, to make a whole bunch of noise. Uh, Back in the Old Testament in 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, you have this conflict between Elijah and the prophets of Baal And uh, Elijah had a little bit of taunting in his soul. Uh, Whether it's sanctified or not, I won't say. But uh, you've got the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, and uh, they're taking this bull that was given to them, and they prepare it, and they they put it on the fire for a sacrifice, and they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. Then they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's musing, or he's relieving himself. You can translate that yourself. Or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud, and they cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. Sorry. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Because Baal is no God at all. Uh, Paul's in Ephesus in the New Testament, and he's in the great theater. You can go there even today, and thousands of people are there, and there's a riot, and the pressure's on Paul, and for almost two people, um, almost two people, you know what two people are? Almost two hours, there we go. For al- That's why I have to continue in dependence upon the Lord, because <laughs> I stink at communicating, so stumbling over my words. Smooth operation here at First Free. But anyway, so here it is, for almost two hours, the people are chanting, great is Artemis of Ephesus, great is Artemis of Ephesus, for two hours, wanting a God who is no God to respond. And so we see Jesus say, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Avoid unusual and unbiblical approaches to prayer meaningless repetition. Now we can give examples from other parts of the world and other cultures. Uh, The times we've been in Thailand and in China, especially with uh, Tibetan Buddhism and some other forms of Buddhism, you see these prayer wheels. 
And they're just spinning constantly. And if you walk by, you're supposed to spin the prayer wheel. They put them on batteries so they keep on spinning. And they've got text uh, from Buddhist religion. And, and the spinning of the wheel is like is putting the prayer requests out there over and over and over and over again. Well, we're not Buddhists, so who are we? We are those, if we're not careful, who can end up going through prayer as ritual. Empty, rote, Ritual. I love a consistent table prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Some of you are my generation. That was very, very common. And it's okay to, to pray a prepared prayer. As long as we're not just going through rote memory, it's the heart that is significant. Or how about prayer as manipulation? Think deeply about your motives because this whole section has a lot to do with motives. How about prayer as manipulation? I'm going to talk myself into or talk God into getting something for me. It's not meaningless babble, but it's an inappropriate use of prayer because it's all about me. Or how about prayer as mysticism? That can happen in our hearts and our minds as well if we're not very careful. As if in prayer I'm creating my own view of God and my own relationship with God. This is the book that guides our prayers. Amen? And so we pray the scriptures, we think about the scriptures, we meditate on the scriptures. But the scriptures, again, I've touched on this a couple times, are not pieces of black ink on a piece of paper detached from relationship. So I'm guided by the, uh, by the scriptures, but I'm guided in my relationship with the Lord. And it's a relationship, and I speak to him, and he speaks to me through his scriptures, to my heart as a real person in relationship with the real God who is there. But everything I hear and think of in relationship to that more subjective part of prayer is guided by the objective truth of scripture, amen? And so many people, so many people slip into forms of mysticism in prayer that are not healthy. You never, never empty your mind in prayer. You don't just sit empty-minded before God and, and, and ask him to, to speak in some sort of subjective way. You engage your mind, and as you sense or hear or feel, even feel the presence of God in prayer, you're lining it up with the scriptures. And yet, we got to be careful that we don't make it so academic, so intellectual, our relationship with the Lord, that we miss the fact that it is a relationship with the Lord. You can't get aside from that in all of the scriptures from beginning to end. Real people interacting with the real God. And so we engage in prayer, in relationship with God through his word, heart and mind, simplicity, directness, and sincerity in talking to God and in hearing from God. Uh, This is not arguing against persistence in prayer. Uh, Don't turn there. I'll give you the opening verse, but it's one of my favorites on this topic. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Jesus told them a parable as to why they should always pray and never give up. And then the parable goes on about a persistent widow who comes to a judge, and the judge finally just throws his hands up and says, give her what she wants, get her off my back. Be careful. God doesn't operate that way. But he lovingly invites his children to come. And Jesus taught that parable so that they would be persistent in prayer. They would bring intercession again and again and again. Not giving up, but always praying. Luke 18, 1-7. Avoid unusual and unbiblical approaches to prayer. Look at verse 8. Always be aware of God's omniscience as we pray. Do not be like them, the Gentiles, all this babbling and so on, trying to manipulate God, blah, 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 blah. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Well, then why should I even ask? (laughs) Take the verse at face value. What is it teaching here? It's teaching about the omniscience of God. God knows the present and the future, everything. And he's known the past as well. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. We could draw some parallels to earthly fathers and mothers and their children. They kind of have a sense as to what their kids need. Sometimes even know before they even come and ask. 
how much more so an omniscient God who knows all things. For your Father knows what you need before you ask. Next week we'll pick up Pray Then like this. We'll spend a couple weeks in the Lord's Prayer and continue teaching on prayer. Your Father knows what you need even before you ask. The Bible affirms this, not just here, but in a number of other places. In Psalm 139, verses 3 and 4, we read this. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways, even before a word is on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Isaiah chapter 65, almost to the end of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24. Similar kind of phrase in reference to who God is. Isaiah 65, verse 24. Before they call, I will answer, God says. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. So, Pause here for just a minute and ask the question, well, how does prayer work then? Does it change God? Does it change us? I'm very appreciative of this quick little paragraph or so from John MacArthur's long series in the Gospel of Matthew. Just listen to this. None of us can comprehend exactly how prayer functions within the infinite mind and plan of God. The Calvinist or Calvinistic view emphasizes God's sovereignty and in its extreme application holds that God will work according to his perfect will regardless of the way men pray or even whether they pray or not. Prayer is nothing more than tuning in to God's will. Next sentence. At the opposite extreme, the Arminian view holds that God's actions pertaining to us are determined largely on the basis of our prayers. On the one hand, prayer is seen simply as a way of lining up with God regarding what he has already determined to do, and on the other hand, it is beseeching God to do what he otherwise would not do. Some of you have been around theology and some of these discussions enough to track with this even as we come down the stretch. Here's what he says. Listen to this. Scripture supports both of these views and holds them, as it were, in tension. The Bible is unequivocal about God's absolute sovereignty, amen? But it is equally unequivocal in declaring that within his sovereignty, God calls on his people to beseech him in prayer, to implore his help in guidance, provision, protection, mercy, forgiveness, and countless other needs. How does it work? I don't know. But what are we to do? We're to come to God in prayer. He longs for us to come. It's his means by which we interact with him by which he works in the world, in his sovereign plan. And that tension is there in the Bible, and we need not be polarized by saying, it has to be one or the other. Prayer changes us, and it is still the means that he uses to carry out his purposes in and through us. Uh, Proudly so, and the right kind of proudly so, first free is a church of the word. And I'm so glad of that. Discussions always going on, even regarding our preaching. Interacting, discussing, talking, not debating for debating's sake, but wanting to be accurate in handling the Scripture. Praise the Lord that we're a church that wants to stay on track with the Word. Amen? I pray also that we are equally a church that is on its knees in prayer for the God of the universe to work mightily in our midst. Father, help us as we walk with you to be about the ministry of the word and prayer in our own lives and in our church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.